Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, the pioneer of sports mascots, speaker and author, Dave Raymond. And now, Rich Redman. What is happening out there in podcast land? Yep, this is another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show coming to you from Music City. That's right, Nashville, Tennessee. And this is the podcast where we talk all about music, motivation, and success. As always, my good pal, Jim McCarthy, JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com, coming to us from Spring Hill, Tennessee. How you doing, Jim? I'm doing well, man, Rich. How you doing? <laughs> we uh, we just interviewed a media personality here in town, Kelly Sutton, a good pal of us, and Jim was gracing us with his impersonation of his News, radio News announcer cast. voice. That's yeah. right. Wow. Give us a little bit more, Jim. No, uh, what, what, what do you want? The uh, uh, let me get it up here. Yeah, get 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 us launching into a song. Maybe uh, some right, Lover Boy. We, it's uh, it's coming up to the weekend. We got a big weekend coming up. We got a belly up to the bar. It's almost five o'clock. Let's hear that steam whistle and let's get some lover eye go for the weekend on ninety-seven point one FM. <laughs> New York. That that's good? a that's a hard skill to to shake. I mean, you you really kill it with the monster truck thing. You really do. <laughs> Now, 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 Jim, I know we're going to have an awesome free-flowing conversation today. Today's guest, check this out. He's a thought leader specializing in happiness, and that's something we need right now. And he spent two decades entertaining more than 60 million people as the original Philly fanatic. He wrote a great book that I consumed. I love it. It's called The Power of Fun. And his Power of Fun philosophy has allowed him to become a keynote speaker and a brand yeah. consultant. And he shared his message on places like NBC Nightly News, HBO, NPR, ESPN, New York Times, and The Tonight Show. Our new friend, Dave Raymond. How are you, Dave? Hey, Rich, Jim. Wow, I sound important. Oh, that's right. I tell you what, you are highly accomplished. This is the book, folks. If you are consuming this with your eye holes, it's called The Power of Fun. And uh, is this is a this is an Amazoner, right? Jeff Bezos, you can get it delivered to your front door. It, it is not. Oh, I, I decided I was for a while, but it, it is now exclusively available at DaveRaymondSpeaks.com. I love that. Okay. You know, we got, look, Amazon's big enough. Jeff has got enough money. Let's find out different ways that we can sell books. Sure. That, that's my theory. I'm sticking to it for now. Dave Raymond speaks .com. You heard it here. Get a signed copy. Now, this is funny. This is what Dave wrote in my book. And I might embarrass him, but I'm just going to share it because I was telling him, I was like, look, it, this has been the bane of my existence. Everybody in my world, everybody in my band, they're guys, guys, right? And it's like, I understand how magical sports are. I mean, it's like sportsmanship, competition, the perseverance, the energy, the hard work that goes into becoming a professional athlete. And I have stood on the 50 yard line of a million football games wearing a snare drum in the freezing cold. But for some reason, I don't know, it never got super sticky with me. Like I can respect all of it, but I don't follow any teams. And so Dave writes in my book, he sends me the book and he goes, Rich, you don't need to know shit about sports to love the power of fun. Best <laughs> wishes, Dave. Okay. So everybody get a copy of this book. It is so entertaining, man. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. You know, what's funny about you when, when we talked and you said, you know, I'm not a sports fan and I thought you were joking and I, I can't remember what, what the topic was, but it was something that, you know, most ancillary sports fan would know. And you were like off the planet, but you <laughs> look like, you look like a sports fan. That's your problem. You Somehow you yeah. have to change your look. People don't think you're a sports fan. Plus, you know, you're a drummer and Jim, I mean, you, you just, you have to be a sports fan and yeah. you're not. That's, I guess you could leverage that, but it, it is funny. Well, I mean, I love the whole idea about like music is kind of like it's a music is a team sport. You're only as good as your weakest link. And like I said, I, you know, backstage, you know, the Braves come backstage, the Red Sox come backstage. I mean, we know so many guys because it's so crazy because athletes want to be musicians and musicians want to be actors and, and, and everybody, the grass is always greener, right? So it's so funny. All these professional athletes, they love chatting with me because I don't know. I don't know. I don't drop any of their stats. I don't ask them about their 
big games. I'm just like, yeah, dude, what's up? I'm backstage, you know, warming up on my paradiddles and they love talking to me because I'm not chatting them up. I'm not a super fan, but I mean, I can respect it. Um, and I was actually uh, in the um, Nashville Predators house band. So we would play like all these like cues and stuff and we were on ESPN we made a hundred bucks and I got a hot meal and my parents got to see me on TV this is going back like to the year 2000 it was fun yeah it's good all it's all wasted on you all the rest of us really diehard sports fans want to be in that, that <laughs> locker room or that backstage with you because <laughs> we get to meet LeBron but you're like who are you huh? what yeah so, Anyway. I haven't met LeBron yet, man. That's a, that would be, he's a formidable physical presence. I would say that what a guy like him comes around, what every 10 years or so. Maybe. I don't know though, the way um, everybody, I'll tell you what, here's the one uh, uh, de defining factor with all great athletes is they're, they are big and they're fast. That, mm -hmm. that, the, you know, the difference between division one college football and the NFL is every single person at whatever weight is exceptionally fast and, and, you know, that's a God given talent. So I all being small and slow, like I was, and I played college football, but I was small and slow. And I, I go, well, if I was just born with better genes, I could be better. So that's my, you know, that, that's my uh, theory about that, but yeah, it, it's amazing how big and fast they are. That that's what I love about watching uh, professional sports. Cause you are just seeing the most elite uh, physical talent ever. Sure. Yeah. And my whole thing is playing the drums. It's a very physical thing. I burn a thousand calories every 90 minutes. My heart rate is in this great zone. I love it and I want to stay relevant. So I get out there and I run my five miles and I do my squat thrusts and I got my medicine ball and I got my adjustable Nordic track weights here in the condo. So it's good. You know, I'm not going quietly into that night. I'm keeping it together. Good. Well, you know, you got the good hair too. <laughs> well, listen, thank you. As do I. Yeah, Jim has got an amazing shorn yeah, cut. Head, though. You know, God knew what he was doing. The people for that are sure. challenge have these perfect round heads. I got a flat spot here and a dent there, I, you know. So it, the I know I can rock there. the bald look. So yeah. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. You do. Bald guys have a lot of testosterone, buddy. So I know the Courtney's very <laughs> pleased. So it's good. Um, so, right. so Dave, you, um, you, your home state is Delaware and you live outside of Philly. You have this amazing relationship with the, this, uh, the Philadelphia. How did this all start for you? Tell us about how this happened. The evolution of you becoming one of the first are you the first person to jump in an outfit for a sports team? No, I did, uh, Ted Giannullis and the San Diego Chicken, they were the first that started. And actually, ah. some of that success inspired my boss, who yeah. was the creative genius behind the fanatic, Bill Giles. But I grew up uh, with sports as a background. Um, my dad was a head football coach at the University of Delaware. He, he's in the College Football Hall of Fame. He, he was listed as the 25th most influential coach in the history of college football. And you probably wouldn't know him. His name, name was uh, Tubby Raymond. Uh, we, we lost him, unfortunately, three years ago at age 92. But he was my hero, Rich. I just wanted to, I didn't think about education. I just wanted to go play football for my dad. And then I wanted to be a coach like my father. And he uh, said, listen, I I've been at the same institution for 50 years as a football coach now in that day, back in the in the mid seventies, he said, you're not gonna be able to replicate that. He goes, I, you know, I know the owner of the Phillies. I can help you get an internship for your last two summers before you graduate. And I'm like, right. ah, okay, I was a, I was a lifeguard. That was a, that was a difficult job to give up for many reasons, yeah. but I figured out, right, I'll go work for the Phillies as an intern. And then after one summer, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I, I can have a, you know, there was no sports marketing back then. You couldn't get that as a degree. I couldn't believe I could have a full-time job actually working for the team that, you know, I've been rooting for since I was six years old. And besides the University of Delaware football, it was the, it was the Phillies. So it was supposed to be a two-year internship. Uh, so 76 and 77, I thought they were going to say, hey, Dave, go graduate. We might have something for you when you graduate. And instead, they go, hey, do you want your job back in 1978? It was very early in the spring. And I went, yeah, sure. What do you want me to do? They said, go to New York and get fitted for the costume. And you're like, what? what? Yeah. And I, and I started to complain, you know, young kid going, they go, hey, Dave, just go to New York and get fitted for the costume. And, and I did that. And just a few months later in, in April, a uh, costume was delayed in its construction, but I had seen the drawing and I was all excited. But then you know, the guys who uh, were my co-interns who grew up in Philly and were said, hey, you idiot, 
you're going to dress as a 300 pound green furry Muppet. And your job is to entertain the same fans that food Santa Claus and the Easter bunny. It doesn't <laughs> end well. And I went to my, and I got the costume, tried it on in the morning. That was the first night I was supposed to go out. Now, now get this, especially, you know, with the work that you do to entertain Rich and Jim, you understand all the preparation you do. I, I had no experience other than Halloween. I, I didn't know what I was doing and there was no plan. No one had wait, said, wait. okay, it's such and such a time. We're going to go out. We're going to announce I'm you. I'm supposed to prepare? Yeah, it was like the curtain went over. I'm on a Broadway show and I don't know who yeah. I'm playing. And the lights are shining in your face and you're like, <laughs> what is my line? Exactly. So, hey. Right. <laughs> so I, and I'm thinking I'm going to be lit on fire and hung in effigy. And but anyway, so my boss says when he sees this fear of mine, he goes, David, just go out and have fun. If you're not having fun, the fanatic won't be funny. And if fanatic's not funny, it's not going to work in front of our fans. So I'm a college kid. I got a dream job, even though I was getting paid. Uh, I was getting paid $5 an hour and they were paying me $25 a game to start this thing. And I went, great. I'm going. And then he realized he told a college student that my prime directive was to have fun. And he screamed after me, G rated fun, G rated fun. So right, right, I had right. the box. So I went out and decided, you know what? I love the three stooges. I love uh, Warner brothers cartoons. I'm a Phillies fan. I know our insecurity. I understand who we hate, who we love and why we uh, strive to, you know, to win, even though we know we're going to lose. Cause that was kind of the way, we were as Phillies fans and <laughs> I knew baseball because, you know, my dad actually started as a baseball coach. I played baseball through my athletic career as well as football. So I understood the sport. And I, and for me, one of the best things I did was jump over the railing during the break in between inning and go fool around with an umpire or high five one of the players because I wanted to do that because they were my heroes too. Yeah. So it just, it was just all the wonderful combination of my leaders trusting me giving me my directive, G-rated fun and have at it. When I made a mistake, I didn't get in trouble. They actually sat me down and said, what do you think? Why did you do it? I'm like, well, you're my boss. You're, you're one of the top executives in the Phillies. Why are you talking to me? They said, well, we're, we're going to work this out together. And that's the way it was for 16 years was let's, let's collaborate. Let's, and, and all of the great things that we ended up doing with the Fanatic and um, you know, and, and I, my company helped uh, build and design and create Gritty for the Flyers. So we did the same thing modern day, what we did back in the 70s. Um, there was just social media for Gritty. And, and it, it just today, that's what I love about it. Pardon the pun. The fanatic is evergreen. Yes, but he's he is. Still- He's still entertaining kids and building new fans. And, and uh, you know, Rich, you, I'm sure, get recognized. People want to talk to you. And especially when they learn who you are and what you do, they get all excited. But in my case, I'm worried when the father is telling the 12-year-old son or daughter, hey, do you know who that is? And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, they're not going to get it. And then he goes, he was the original Philly fanatic. And the kids go, oh, really? You know, if I, I, I kind of I feel like I've aged out, but the fanatic is still going strong. And the, the gentleman who... You know, who replaced me as a best friend of mine who worked as my understudy for five or six years before I left the Phillies. And it's it's just it's an amazing um, just collaboration and and a beautiful um, proof of how powerful fun can be. Well, that little did you know that that would be some of the best advice you ever got in your life. Just go out there and have fun. So for 16 years, you did just that. How hot is it in that damn thing? (laughs) Well, you were talking about working out the the. The beauty and the curse of it was, and I, I had done double sessions in football. I knew what it was like to work hard and to sweat, but I didn't know what it was like to do all of that and then be covered completely in like a, you know, a, a, a winter coat with a, with a hat. Uh, <laughs> in the so, summer. <laughs> so it, it, nothing was harder, Jim. Nothing was harder than this. And so what happened was I was relatively used to being physically stressed. So I adapted quickly and then I was in the best shape of my life when the season ended. So we have 82 home games. I was doing almost 300 appearances and I was traveling to some of the other minor league teams that the Phillies operated. Wow. And I was losing. I, I would go from 179 all the way down to 162 for the, and that was real weight, not just water weight. And then my job in the off season was to eat <laughs> yeah, to eat and to drink. And, and then, so I did, I, when I left the Phillies, I continued to perform for another almost 10 years. So once that stopped and I was into my late forties and I stopped the performance, I was still working out, but nothing like that. I was still eating like that. So Uh-oh. 
in, in about 10 years of that, I realized, holy crap, I got to start getting back to what you were talking about was. You're you know, starting to look like me now. <laughs> <laughs> I would kill to be 162 pounds. Because if you look at like, well, no, if you look at like a standard, like a body mass index, you know, where they say like somebody that's, you know, I, I'm five, seven, but I tell everybody I'm five, eight, it says I'm supposed to be like 160 to 168. Right. But usually I'm somewhere around like 172, 173, but you know, like Pacquiao is 160. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, but that body mass index, while it's very good, just does not, it's, it's unfair to call somebody that's your size and say you got to 185, they would say you were obese. getting morbidly obese. Yeah. And I'm like, I know. That's not, you know, you also can put on a little muscle weight too. So they, yeah, so they don't yeah. make allowances for that. But it's, it is amazing what um, happens to us when we, when we, we move towards the, uh, well, now I'm at an age at, on February 7th. I turn the age where I'm got I'm in I move up the line of the of the vaccine. <laughs> so like, I'm oh, the, right. uh, yeah. So I I turned sixty five on the seventh of February, and I'm like, yes, because <laughs> I can. Dude, wow, you look great, dude. I, I mean, know. you, you, you don't even have fantastic. any gray, barely any gray hair. I was yeah. I was pickled for what almost uh, twenty five <laughs> years in these costumes, that, and I was working in the summer, so none of the elements were getting to me. So. I mean, it's, it's yeah. probably pretty, I mean, this is, you know, the uh, interesting thing about the aging bladder back then <laughs> was it pretty, it was a pretty easy Did you just hold it the whole time. Oh, yeah. you, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Every time I wake up in the middle of the night and go into the bathroom, I'm like, damn, this is I easy. I could go back to be to oh, yeah. 20 again. It's, oh yeah. Now I'm peeing at like two, four and eight. Yeah, it's and like, what is happening? The, 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 the additional pain is not the problem. It's that you're, you're always continuing to go when you pull up your pants too, no matter what you do. So yeah. it's like, could you just finish? Cause I'd like it just to be over now. now I mean, I'm going enough, so I should be able to finish. Right. I, the rest yeah. of it, you know, don't, we don't have to. <laughs> and waking up your spouse or your girlfriend, like when you're getting up that much and there, and then they, and there's something about like cohabitating or like marriage where you, um, you end up doing the same thing. You know, so now she's peeing that much and it's just like crazy. I'm sorry. I really took a massive detour because I really want to shine a light on you. I also remember reading in the book, this was another kind of pivotal moment for you. You were called a professional idiot and you had a run in with a Los Angeles marching band director, but it became a massive success story. Tell us that story. Wait, and it, and it is so the, the, the lessons that I provide, uh, you know, the F-U-N of fun and N stands for this, the, the word no, that if we're going to do something that's a little unexpected and, and in injecting fun into times in our lives when you wouldn't expect, you know, you get some negative feedback. But, you know, one of the things that I was allowed to do in Philadelphia was whatever you want to get involved with pregame, go ahead and do it. Well, we had bands, high school, college bands come in all the time in Philadelphia, and I would run out, involve my spontaneous work with them, and the band directors who were the worst fun killers of all time would actually see that when the fanatic came out to the band, they got highlighted more. The crowd watched them more. It wasn't just ancillary entertainment. Now the fanatic is like a, you know, a laser pointer on their band. So they grew to love it. The opposing uh, team would watch this work. They'd go home to their organization and say, Hey, that fanatic, he's doing some really amazing things pregame all, you know, he's really helpful. Well, then those directors of promotions and marketing are looking to do different things. So in the early eighties, they, said to the Philly, hey, bring the fanatic out, you know, to entertain our fans like like he entertains your fans. And when I and I was excited because I'm going to L.A., you know, Tinseltown. And I, I got to fly in the team plane. I dressed in the visitor's locker room at Chavez Ravine and players threw me out on the dugout. And then just the chorus of booze. And I'm like, oh, you're oh, I had just thought for the first time. I was just thinking these are new fans. I can use my old material and it still work. Yeah. And they were booing me and booing me and I couldn't fix it. And. Just when I thought I was going to go back in the dugout and quit, I, I see a band file out and I ran right out. I said, oh, this will work. I kissed the, the drum majorette and passed out. She laughed, stepped right over the top of me and the band's doing their thing. And the, now the crowd's not booing. They're actually laughing, a little bit of applause. And I'm going, perfect. And then I, I feel this vice grip on my arm and it's the band director and he's screaming at me. Get off the get off the field! You're ruining the show. These kids have worked hard, and I ripped my arm away from him, and I started running away from him, and I'm weaving in and around the in in the band, and he's chasing me. Now, the fans are going nuts. I I went from you know all this horrible sound of disapproval to a raucous approval, and I'm like, I got to get off. I, I I can't do any better than this, and I started running off the field 
to get away from the band director and I'm stopped by the horrific sight of two LA police officers running right at me and they're, they're motorcycle police. So they look nasty. The band director has caught me because I was distracted and he's so excited. He's screaming at the police. I got him. I got him. Yeah, come on, get him off the field. <laughs> the police officers ran right past the fanatic, grabbed the band director and dragged him off the field. And I'm like, yes, perspective. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the band gets a stand innovation because the fans, a eh, little Muppet show broke out in the middle of their routine. Yep. They never missed a note. They never skipped a beat. And they're marching off single file, stand innovation, fanatics bowing down. I'm not worthy. And, you know, I eventually went and met the band director and apologized. And he stopped me. He goes, hey, they, I didn't. He goes, I didn't know you were a professional. And that's where I coined idiot. I said, well, I'm a professional idiot. But <laughs> said, the band never would have gotten a standing ovation if it weren't for you. And I said, no, no, you were the straight man. <laughs> you set it all up. And so, so it, the, the whole focus on that is that what I did with that band looked spontaneous, but it was practiced over and over and over again. I knew how to highlight them and not get in their way. Yeah. So I was doing what I knew that I did well. The band director is some leader that suddenly realizes, oh my God, I've got to protect my people. You know, there, there's, you know, there's an intruder. I've got yes. to get off. And he responded because that was his natural instinct. But, but if I had gone to him and said, hey, look, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. I'm approved by the Dodgers because he thought some crazed Philadelphia fan, you know, had just run on the field in this costume. Right. right. <laughs> like, and I told him, and if I said, look, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I do. And you know what? Your band is going to get even more attention. He would have been, okay, let's try it. But, and he may give me some G-rated fun, you know, yeah. uh, box to go in and then I would go do it. So, the, the, the story for me was if I'm going to just release fun on people who are not expecting it, I got to make sure that I've worked with leadership. I've made it appropriate and I've proved to them that I'm a professional at this and this is serious fun. You know, it's not a bull in the China shop. It's not sticking on a red clown nose and acting crazy. It's actually a process that is rehearsed. I mean, you, everything you do on stage. Yes. To get people's attention you could, and people go, oh my God, look at that. He, he spun the drumstick. He flipped it up. He did this. And they think, wow, they just assume that this is the first time that you've done that. And you know how hard you work on all of your showmanship. Yeah. And, but, it, but when you deliver it every night, you have this great ability to make it look like it's the first time you've done it. And yes, and, yeah, and it takes work and hard work. And, it, and so when people say how entertaining you are and how great of a performer you are, what a great musician you are, they don't care the work that you've done. They just care how you entertain them. The results. They don't know all the work that you've done. They're just happy that you did it. So, it, you know, the power fund tells you that you are going to have people that are not going to approve of this. So you need to make sure they understand you're a professional, you're working at it. And, and together we're going to build something that has great ROI. Yes. Well, now what is, cause you're, you're an acronym guy. Fun is an acronym for me. Crash is an acronym. I'm a big fan of it. What does it stand for? And take us through that. So the, it, so there are four lessons. The F U N of fun are the building blocks. And then there's the power of distracting fun, which is the thing that we should have been using in the pandemic. It is, it is uh, the most powerful tool that you have during the most difficult times. So F stands for the force that fun is. And I say, we're kind of like Jedi Knights because all you need to do is, is acknowledge the fact that fun is a force um, and then value it. We do not value fun because we understand it as being silly, goofiness, a time off. We don't think of it as a very important tool. So I tell my, tell my audiences, force, it's, it's there for the taking, you engage it, and then you value it. You is fantastic because it works everywhere. I performed at funerals as the fanatic. Um, Bobby and Ethel Kennedy's private residence, I did a family function for the Kennedys. Uh, General Electric Polymer Engineers Convention, um, you know, churches, uh, all kinds of uh, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, weddings. <laughs> um, and I say, if it works at a funeral, where else it will not work. But what it does is it allows you to cross borders, barriers, circumstances, political divides, and disruption. Sure. And the final is the, is the power of distracting fun is uh, when I talk to my audiences, what do you do for fun? And Rich, you would say, I, I love playing my music. I go out with my buddies for a beer. Um, take, take my family on a vacation. And then, I, then if I asked you, how can fun save your life? You're going to have to think about that. 
and you may not have an answer. So the worst times of your life is when you must, you have to design these intentional activities that take away your focus and give you a break for a few minutes. So I would say to you, Rich, if you were sick or you were helping somebody who is very ill, that going and playing on the drums are what you need to do to get into the flow state and forget about things for a while. Yes. Then when you get off those drums, you're like, I'm good. It's still tough. And it's still awful what you're going through. But if you if you find two or three things like playing the drums that you can go to for just a few minutes to refresh, yeah, then you will be able to attack it. You'll be able to overcome. Um, you'll be able to help someone die with dignity. And I and and I'm hoping I'm going to be able to live up to this promise that when it's my time to go, I've done it with grace. I've done it with dignity because I understand, you know, how to get me through those times and. And, and prepare my family to be able to be without me. So this is why I, I've seen this work. I lived it. I breathe that there's science behind it. Um, and that's like you, I love to talk to audiences that they have something that is going to make them, you know, feel, think and act differently. And, and this is a great one. Absolutely. So when did that, I love that. And, and it's easy to remember what, when did the, the, you as a professional keynote speaker, how, when did that start for you? And was yeah. there, how did that, how did that happen as a, as an option for you? It, and it's just, isn't it amazing though, the industry, it's, 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 it's huge and it's diverse and it's, it's so interesting. You could click on a button and watch all kinds of live talks uh, online that you've never heard the people before and their message is awesome. So that's what I love about it. Absolutely. But ever since I started with the Phillies, people would say, hey, come talk to our Rotary, come talk to our group, come talk to our team. We want to hear about what it's like to be the fanatic. And that's how it started. Now, I've only treated it professionally like a business for the last three and a half years ah. because, well, there, from a financial standpoint, you, you couldn't ignore, you know, I used to shake their hand and take a check and say, thank you. And when those, when those checks started to move the needle in terms of revenue, I said, as a business person, I, I got to focus, you know, why is this happening? Um, but the biggest change for me came when I recognized when I started to evolve into a message that helped me overcome the death of my mom, the dissolution of my marriage, the passing of my father. Uh, when I realized that I was actually happier through those times than most, I was able to overcome them because my job forced me to be involved in joy. So I started to formulate the power of fun. And you know this, when you have somebody from your audience that comes up and says, hey, I was a first responder uh, after 9-11, uh, I, I wish I had heard this message the day after. Or, and here's the here's the the one that I love to tell, uh, and it it makes you and I know it empowers you. Say I've got to do this. I've got to deliver this message. I spoke to a lot of um, high school kids who had won the right to come to Philadelphia after writing a great essay, right. and they come and learn about free enterprise and and the freedoms this country allows us, and they would visit Philadelphia. And I would come in and talk to them over the course of about four years. I I must have talked to four or 5,000 high school kids, 45 kids at a time. Yeah. And I would get done and, and we were in a, in a small little environment and the kids would usually come and say, hey, thank you. It was nice to meet you. And that was it. So this young girl comes up to me one time, just as cute as possible. She was about 17 years old. And she said, hey, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And she said, like she was talking about getting a, a coffee at a Starbucks, she goes, you know, I've been thinking a lot about suicide, but after hearing your talk tonight, I, I don't think I'll think about it anymore. And I went, and I just had to, you, you know, the, the shock that that hit me with. And I, I tried to bite my lip and I went, oh, uh, could you do me a favor? And she said, sure. I said, when you get home, she was from Florida. I said, when you get home, I hope that you'll find a friend or a family member that you'd be comfortable sharing that with. She goes, okay, thanks a lot. And then, and then I realized that kids at that age, they just look at, suicide, depending on their struggles, as an option. They don't look at it as permanent. They just, and, and those are the things where you don't see it. You don't see a kid like that. You, yeah. Oh, you know, Sally, she's so, you know, bubbly and excited and so wonderful. I was going to say bubbly. It's crazy. They, we both said bubbly. And then, and then it, you know, and, and so that is what got me to think, one, I can feel like I'm doing something good too. Listen, I, I love to be in front of an audience and I love to really work hard to move them. And, uh, and I've worked hard on my stage craft and, and I wish I had all the experience on stage that you had, but you know, I pulled from my experience at the fanatic yeah. and, and looking into a camera and trying to connect uh, like we're doing now virtually. And sure. so I, I think it's a good combination. It's, it's what I love to do. 
uh, it's where I'm most comfortable. And then I really appreciate the fact that the message is getting through because, you know, I had the negative critic going, eh, it's a bunch of bullshit. You're making it up. You're just yes. trying to make money. You know, you're just trying to get in front of an audience. And so it's, it's nice to get the validation and, and realize that you're, you know, do effective and well, you, you are know. making a difference. And, and this is what, this is some of your takeaways for if anybody's out there that wants to hire my friend virtually to do this, uh, to do his speech, the power of fun, um, how to value fun as a tool to build relationships, manage conflicts and become a better leader. And that's what so many speakers, they focus on leadership. That's very common. I'd love that. Create and use serious fun to combat stress and emotional turmoil and difficult times. Learn four lessons of fun that we just talked about to develop a workplace culture and foster employee engagement engagement, retention, and productivity. This is you speaking my language here and learn how to use fun to connect with people on an emotional level. So you hire Dave Raymond, DaveRaymondSpeaks.com. That's what you're going to get all wrapped up in fun. And you, you talk a lot about um, the brain and how I, you know, I think about this a lot. I did a little, little uh, webinar last night about mindset for creatives and the idea that I think as human beings, in our DNA, our brain is wired for negativity because back in the day, we were running from woolly mammoths and we were trying to keep a fire lit and we were trying to not just survive. And if we made it to 30, we were an old, old elder of the, of the clan, right? And, and uh, so around every corner, we're looking at danger, like not trusting a single thing. So our brain is wired that way to be negative. So to be in a positive flow, we almost have to not listen to the negative inner voice. We have to focus more on faith and positive talk talking to ourselves instead of listening to the negative voice talking to ourselves saying you're good enough you're smart enough you work hard enough this is going to be a great month you're going to make it through this that positive reinforcement the rich redman show will be right back those who are self-employed especially musicians think home ownership is unattainable for bruce klein it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician but once he did man was it satisfying so he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey if you're a self-employed musician he can help Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948. Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179. NMLSconsumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. This is a great little uh, trick or game you can play with your family. And, and I submit to everybody, stop meeting somebody and say, hey, how you doing? Because you've basically given them permission based on the negative brain bias to throw up all over you with all their problems. <laughs> and, and, it, and then that conversation, regardless of how much you love or care about that person and want to help them, and yeah, tell me your struggles, it just is a conversation that, that, that goes into a focus of negativity. So instead of that, from now on, and you guys try this tomorrow, tell me something good. And the first thing that you'll see is, you don't say how you're doing, say, hey, Rich, tell me something good. And you'll go, all right, tell me something good. Uh, 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 my kid. Think about it. My girlfriend, yeah, and, and the negative brain bias, we, we all have to think when we're asked a question, but here's the game that you play. So you have your stopwatch or your phone with your uh, timer on it, and you push the timer, start the timer when you say, tell me something good, and when they give you a response, any response, stop the timer, and you'll have a few seconds, maybe three or four seconds. Then ask them, tell me somebody you hate, or 
tell me something that just really drives you crazy and push the timer and stop the timer. The negative response is always less of a delay than the, than the positive response. Yeah. And if it isn't, it means somebody has worked on it or evolved, like you said, has learned how to build a new habit loop that, you know, stay away from the news. I mean, somebody told me that they were in, uh, trying to impeach President Trump. I've said, what? I, don't even, I didn't even hear about it. Because I, I just, I'm no. I turned off the news. You I don't just, marinate in it. Yeah, I, it, because mm. it just consistently gets me into a negative frame because that's sure. the way they sell the news. Um, so See, when I, people may, ask I may me be how less I, informed, but I'm happy. <clears throat> if someone asks me how I'm doing, I always find the most inappropriate ways to respond. Like, <laughs> oh, not much. You ever have that where somebody asks, hey, how's it going? Oh, not much. <laughs> That's right. Well, look, yeah, yeah, well, you can quickly know that maybe this is not the person you want to or, talk or to. They're not very, yeah. they're not listening to you. And that's what really what I'm trying to do. Like there's, you know, prof personal development is a lifelong thing. I mean, mm -hmm. here we are in our midlife and we're still working on canceling out the negative negativity, marinating our mind in positivity, celebrating the positive, mm -hmm. accentuating the positive, doing our gratitude <laughs> list, staying in the land of unicorns and rainbows. It takes effort. I mean, it doesn't come naturally. It really doesn't. It, 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 you have to practice it. Yeah. So I do my gratitude thing in the shower. Jim, do you do something like similar where like, I take a shower every day I and just, I'm, you know. Uh, I, yeah, it's a gratitude thing. And I, I acknowledge all the different things in your life that are good. And you just, I, I just keep like what Dave is saying. I don't marinate. If it's out of my control sphere, I don't, I don't worry about it. Well, that's yes. I've given up. Yeah. And that's just, you know, is it, can I control it? No. Then what, what am I going to, why am I going to take years off my life worrying about it? And, yeah. and that's, an evolved, and that's that, an evolved, that's an evolved skill that you, you know, yeah. happiness is a yeah. skill set. that you I, and, I, and I learned it in the most dis de evolved business, the car business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if, the if most you have carnal. Stress, you got to, you got to, yeah. there's well, more. I mean, I had a boss tell me. Because in that business, you had so many things that happened that were detrimental to your mental state um, that you had no control over uh, or very little control over. And, you know, I had a boss tell me one time, look, you have a circle around you in a 360 degree sphere uh, within, within, you, within it, you, that's what you can control. Okay. Everything else beyond that sphere, you cannot control. Yeah. And that's way, the way you got to look at it. It's always going to be something. Somebody even in the car, there's so much wisdom that I gleaned out of the car business. Someone told me, because uh, I was complaining about a deal unwinding one day and this, this older gentleman I was good friends with, another salesperson, he came up to me and he says, it's always something. And I go, my gosh, isn't that true? You know, and it was also almost like a release of tension. Once I acknowledged that, yeah, life, it's always going to be something. And once you realize that, it's okay. I stole well, that from you, Jim. Something. I totally, I have been totally celebrating that and just embracing the fact that yeah. as we in our modern society and as entrepreneurs, we're juggling a million things. You know, Jim is producing 15 podcasts, doing voiceovers, feeding a family. He's got a lighting company. We're, you're juggling a million things. And just realizing that there's always a hiccup. There's always something coming at you that it's just, and so as you make just peace with that and just like, my thing is that I, I, um, and my girlfriend's been calling me out on this. Like I, I'll huff, like just, it's almost like I'm releasing, like just the tension of the day coming out of my face. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to not do that. Hey, I'm proud of myself. Last year, I got myself off the habit of touching my face because they say, <laughs> they say that the human, a human man, especially touches their face, like, 2,000 times a day. And I think I got it down to like 200 times a yeah. day, maybe 20. And, and, and once you're depressed, like one face. of the things you needed to do to stay safe from COVID is to take your hands away from your face. Because I'm I'm constantly, you're, you're right. Every, right? You're I mean, right. guys, we just are like, we're just pit, pulling our nose hair and, <laughs> and checking our beard growth. Well, guys, okay, here's, here's a good example, okay? And this is a, a theory that I've always had with a lot of people that are deathly afraid of getting COVID right? I'm like, there are going to be people that get it. And there are going to be people that, that say one of two things. All right, here we are. Let's just power through it. We'll come out the other end just fine. Right. Then there are people that get it and say, oh my gosh, this is like a death sentence, you know, and the body responds to that. Yeah. yeah. How you respond, your mind is much more powerful. Your, your brain controls the chemical balances of your body, right? Mm -hmm. So, if all of a sudden you're death, you have a fear that is so just 
off the charts of this thing, yeah, you're probably going to succumb and it's going to, it's going to suck. But I've had people that on, on both sides of it that have come through live, you know, one person, a friend of mine had it. He goes, I said, what happened? He said, I had lower back, pain, lower back pain. And that was it. Oh, okay. And he's a generally positive thinking guy. Yeah. Constantly thinking about what's happening next. So I'm sure well, there's exceptions to the rule, but sure. Yeah, but in the science gives, tells you that there is this DNA set point that you're given because of your genes. And, you, you know, you yeah. can, I always say it's a continuum of Tigger or Eeyore and your, your set point will mm -hmm. be there. But what, what Rich and I, and we've been discussing here is you can actually, so you're in charge of 40% of your mood anyway, it's just kind of up to you. Um, but you can actually move above your DNA set point through the practice. So, you know, gratitude, being kind, uh, being vulnerable, um, you know, knowing the intentional activities that you can go to, to, to distract yourself for a few minutes, whether it's meditation or a walk, yeah. you work hard on those. You actually can, no matter if you're really happy in your set point, you can rise above that. Um, and that you can, you will always, if you stop working, you'll, go down to your set point, but that's what, that's why it's a lifelong opportunity. Yeah. It'll change the it's, way you, know, you think and it will make you that's happier why and healthier. I see a lot of people like, you know, the, the, the theory and the dream that they sell people over the past, I don't know, 30 years about, you got to save for retirement. You know, that whole thing is like, I think that killed more people than any virus on the planet because, you know, my father wanted to retire. He retired and three years later he was dead. So, I mean, it's, it's, you, you, once you all of a sudden, if you are in a job that you want to retire from, you're in the wrong line of work. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's not the objective of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and I don't you know, see either one of do? you guys retiring. I don't see either <clears throat> don't one of you. I don't want to retire. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I don't want to retire. My father-in-law is 76 years old, you know, and he still goes to work every day. Yeah. It's and purpose. Yeah. Retiring, <clears throat> you know? I think retiring, you know, back in the sixties was a different thing. It was part of what the life cycle was supposed to be, but you know, all retirement to me means I'm selecting the jobs that I want to take. I'm not working with the people that drive me crazy anymore. And I have enough money yeah. to go travel. That's what's the beauty about the speaking business is retiring for a speaker is going, you know, if you got 30 or 40 opportunities, you select five because they're taking you to Hawaii and then, you know, to Hong Kong. And then you get to go to, um, you know, some place in the beautiful area of our country. Well, that's purpose. And, yeah. that, and that's, yeah. that becomes, so for me, that that is the beauty for me. I'm not going to go, although I love golf, I don't want to go join a country club and play golf and play pinochle no. in the afternoon. Yeah. I mean, I, I will succumb and, and die a lot sooner that way. So um, I, I think worked Walt in a nursing home. to build our, yeah. our form of retirement and, and sell guided My packages for retirement. <laughs> My first job, uh, legal job, was working as a dietary aide in a nursing home when I was 15 years old. Wow. And, you know, that was an amazing perspective shift in that time of my life because I'm seeing people at the end of theirs, you know, and the biggest highlight of their day was lunch. Yeah. I'm like, dude, just put a bullet in my head. I'm, yeah. You know, <laughs> no. Now we're this lucky is, guys. We, no, we're we're lucky life. guys. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, now Dave. You have a company that helps create mascots, right? Yeah, that was <laughs> that, that's what my my career when I left the Phillies was all about about doing that. And, yeah, and, and and all the principles of of the power of fun are are really part of what made the fanatic success. So that when I'm talking to clients, I'm using those same principles. Only it's really geared right down to the bottom line benefit for your brand to stand out yeah. to be powerful. So. If you could, if you ask any business person, look, I'm going to give you a tool that will allow your brand to rise above the noise. And not only will it be very successful in terms of being memorable, people can't wait to get to it to take a photograph of it and then share that photograph for years and say, oh, look who I met, look who I was with. And that's what a great character brand can do is, you know, people want to hug your brand. They want to take a picture of the brand. They want to post pictures on social media with this brand. Um, and that's why the Fanatic has been so successful for the Phillies and continues and yeah. why Gritty for the Flyers just went into the stratosphere because he was unique. He was different. His backstory was funny. Um, he was really designed to kind of frighten kids, which doesn't make it's counterintuitive. But that's part of the reason why it caught on so well was that, you know, the kids were a little frightened, but 
the way he performed and the way he got in front of these kids, they were, they did want to hug him, but it took a little bit of work. <laughs> to do. Like my, my friend, Kurt Allison, our guitar player in our band, always says, Rich, you would be such an amazing mascot because I'm, you know, fearless <laughs> and I, I, I don't mind making a fool of myself. And just, so if, if Jim and I were mascots, what, what would, what would our characters be like? Like, well, that, you know, part of the process would be for you and I to discover that. Right. Yeah. So, you have to say some authentic part. So this idea of selling cars, um, you, how you became a musician, you build that into your character. And then what's great about it is the, the visuals of that character come later. You have to, you have to tell the story first. So um, I'll tell you what, you'd be one of the guys, Rich, whose hair was on fire. <laughs> and, and the mascot was constantly running around thinking it was trying to put the fire out, but it was actually making it bigger. Oh my God. Uh, so, so that would be one component I want to work with. And I, I just look at Jim as being kind of the, the sage wise uh, character that would be laughing at the guy with his fire on his hair and say, wait a second, let me show you how to do yeah. this. So, so he would be your be, advisor. Be the, um, you would be the student and Jim would be the, the teacher. <laughs> I would be the Oliver to your Hardy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. No, Laurel no, and Hardy. It was a Stan, Stan Laurel, uh, yeah, Laurel. Yeah. So Stan Laurel. So I'll be the Oliver Hardy to your Stan Laurel. Yeah, man. Oh, as a team, okay. I think I think we would kill it. <laughs> Standing next to each other, we'd look like the number ten. All right, I've got to. I have to copyright this very quickly so you guys can't. Run <laughs> so Dave, is are there other mascots that are out there that are working right now that you look at and you go like, ooh, I like that. I like that guy. I, I like that I character. Think, and there's thousands that you wouldn't know about. So a lot of minor league sports have great character brands. But, you know, so, you know, we have the Mascot Hall of Fame in Whiting, Indiana. So uh, we had a couple of re recent inductees, Blue from the, the Colts, uh, Yuppie from Montreal. The reason why I love Yuppie was he started as the Expos as a Major League Baseball mascot. Team goes under. He's a free agent for a couple of years and he gets picked up by the Canadiens. So it, there's no other mascot in the history of mascots that had actually left one professional sport and was adopted by another. So. Yuppie is, a, is amazing. And wow. also, Yuppie is probably, I think, one of the most well-marketed characters. They've done, you know, the, the Expos and also the Canadians have been great at supporting him. And the Canadian fans just love him. And I think that, that's one of the biggest reasons why these people get inducted into Hall of Fame is when they can demonstrate that their fans really love them. So, but go to your local minor league sports team. And as soon as we get back to it, baseball was really slammed because all of minor league baseball shut down. And there's like 360 minor league teams around the country. Wow. They are fabulous. You can buy a beer for like three bucks, get a hot dog for a dollar fifty. And their mascots there are always young people, you know, working out their craft. And it's it's a fabulous place to take your family. So when we get back to fans in the stands, yes, I want you to go back to the major leagues, but go and everybody is close to some minor league organization. Go there, wow. check it out, and and get affordable family fun. Um, and the rest of us who like beer can, can drink more than yeah. one. Yeah. Jim, do we still have the Nashville sounds? I went to a sounds game like yeah. in 2000 or something like that. I don't yeah. know. Who, I don't know who their mascot is. It's, oh, you got, uh, um, the predators mascot is a big one. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, Nash. Nash. One of the best Nash. Nash. Yep. Um, I know Adam, now the, uh, Nash's best friend is named Adam. That's right. <laughs> have you watched that show behind the mask when it came out? Yes, Hulu? We, we, were, we were actually a consultant on that show. We helped them with casting. Wow. So we helped yeah, find because I knew I worked with Davey. Uh, I don't think it's Davey, but the guy who uh, played the UNLV Hey Reb mascot. Yeah, yeah he was a graduate. He was, a, he was graduating through the course of the show. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And, and, and the guy who was the, uh, the mascot for the, the minor league hockey team that was affiliate of the Pittsburgh Penguins, um, he, was, mm -hmm. he was phenomenal. He's great. And he is. He got his opportunity to go to professional hockey as well. So um, it was great to see Chad, uh, you know. Make Rich, did you see that show? The mask behind the mask? Behind the mask. It behind the a, mask. It's fascinating. It's a, it's a, you know. Yeah, is it, uh, was it like a documentary on Netflix or something? Or? Yeah. yeah it was like a, a docu-series, yeah, docu uh, reality show kind of thing. Yeah. Cool. And so what they did was they gave us casting descriptions 
and we help them find the performers that fit that casting description as much as possible. So there was the kind of the nerdy kid that was trying to figure out a, a way to get noticed in high school uh, to get a date yep. with, you know, the good looking uh, senior. And so we've, we've helped them find that. And I actually, I was very proud that the second season I was able to get a gentleman by the name of Chris Hall, who has, who has autism. And he was working locally here in the Northeast market as you know, like the mascot for Wawa, which is our, our local convenience store. Uh, he was working for the, um, uh, the soft ice company. Um, and he was doing a lot of those. And I was uh, contacted through his synagogue to help him. And I got him a number of jobs working as performer. And I was able to get the casting director to look at him as being one of the real wonderful personalities to have people care about. And Chris did a fabulous job uh, on the second season. So, and I'm still very good friends with Chris. He's still working in costume and it's really helped him have gainful employment in a situation where he might struggle to do something that is much fun as being a mascot. Oh God, it sounds like so much fun. Jim, how about the random question of the day, man? Oh yeah, now yeah. you're bringing it on me. Let me get the thing. Uh -oh. You didn't tell me about this. <laughs> That's yeah, we got a random, random question. Random question of the day. Yeah, very random. Here we go. It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. There we go. Beautiful. Dave, what would your perfect bar look like? Oh, uh, that's a good one. Uh, well, it's obviously going to have a picture of the, the 1980 World Series trophy because that was the, the mm -hmm. heart of it. But I, a lot of neon. And there would be an, an, an ode to something. There would be all kinds of music opportunity to play throughout the, I mean, I'd have the best sound system that would make your ears bleed. And then I had to have a fabulous pitcher because I make kick-ass margaritas, which is my promise to you two when we get together. Yes. I'm making you my margarita, a little strawberry margarita with, the, with high test. I mean, it's a Grand Marnier and some <laughs> extra shot or two of tequila. And the sure. tequila is usually a cheaper tequila because when you mix it, you're wasting good tequila. Yeah. But it doesn't matter when you mix it in a margarita. So a lot of margaritas and, a, and tremendous music, which will run the gambit um, from, from oldies to popular to country. Yeah. Um, you know, a little bit of Broadway show tunes. Sorry, but I. What's a, a what's an odd uh, tape? Uh, what have you been listening to lately? That's kind of off kilter because I've got yeah. something. Um, Anything well, come, come I, I, mind? because of my son, Dylan, I've listened to a lot. We're watching this crazy show called um, the Bizarre Adventures of Jojo, Japanese anime. Mm -hmm. And the music is created for the show is just uh, all in Japanese and just crazy stuff, but amazing beats. And then we do get some of the translations. So I've been I've been listening to that and actually been kind of uh, surprised how much I enjoy it. But I think you know my favorite is is Motown, uh, you know, the sounds of Philadelphia, and um, the one one of my all time favorite relaxing tunes is Lovely Day, uh, Withers. Oh, Bill Withers, you gotta love it. Yeah, he man. Just, Rich, uh, what, what, you, what what's kind of what odd stuff are you listening to these days, Rich? You know, Kara and I have been just like going down, it's like down the middle. Like we, we have dinner together and we'll turn on the Spotify and I just been wearing out the old stuff like rumors, Eagles, Bob Marley, uh, Hall and Oates. I mean, we just been going like down the greatest hits of the eight track era, you know, yeah. we really have. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, but yeah, you know, you have all the, all the music in the world on Spotify for $10 yeah, a month. Yeah, I resisted yeah. it forever and ever. I was like, I am not joining the man. And then you just have to, you know, and the technology gets to a point where I have drank the Kool-Aid. I do not have a CD player. I do not have a DVD player. I do not have a cassette player, but I do have an LP player just because I'm part hipster. So I do have that. <laughs> <laughs> I have been listening to the Frozen 2 soundtrack. <laughs> so is it because you just love Disney or but because you have youngsters? No, we, you know, we have kids that like the movie. It was actually a, a pretty decent movie, uh, but the music is just oh, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. It is, I mean, it's, it's well, funny, it's moving, it's got tremendous emotion to it sure uh it's just good stuff and you know i'm probably lesser of a man for admitting that no 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 you're no you're more you're more of a man for admitting your vulnerability <laughs> yes you're incredibly evolved buddy i mean i love that i mean this is what i'm trying to work on my emotional intelligence in my midlife you got it right there jim is your guide remember he is your sage wisdom 
Jim is my muse. He really is. So, Dave, do you have any par- parting I, whenever, wisdom, whenever my Rich friend? Sees, whenever Rich <laughs> sees my number pop up on his phone, it's... <laughs> That's a great ringtone. It's, it's, basic, it's basically just, you know, he kind of has this reaction. Jim and I talk a lot, man. We're putting out two of these things a week. Uh, you know, we got to... We got to book the guests. You got to research the guests. You got to do the thing. It's a lot of fun. We have had so much fun. There's a podcast in your future, huh, Dave? Maybe? Yeah, well, yeah, and working on that. And and actually, uh, this is probably the first place I've ever mentioned it publicly is a, uh, we've got a great opportunity with a new reality, a treatment called Mascot Camp, which is about mm-hmm. uh, a docu-series and elimination where performers from all over the country come in and, and try to win the right to get a, a year performance contract. So nice. um, excited about that. Um, but, uh, you know, this, okay. I just, well, that- this is such a thrill to be, be talking to you guys. I, you know, I am, I geek out, you know, I'm, I'm like the, you know, the athlete, um, and I'll loosely define myself as an athlete who, who wants to be a musician. <laughs> but here's the thing I would tell everybody to go read your book. Um, mm-hmm. my favorite picture, I was staying, I think it was a hard rock hotel in Vegas years and years ago. Uh, with my bride of 25 years, Sandy, and we get off the elevator we're on the floor we're on. And as we walked down, ex- out of our room to walk to the elevator, and there was a, a wall before you got the elevators. And it was a picture of Bruce Springsteen on a raised metal platform with that beautiful circular photo of the, of the crowd. And Sandy always goes, gosh, I just once I want to be there. And you have a couple of those pictures that are just so spectacular of the audience and you behind your drum set. And I'm like, Oh man, I, I want Rich to be my friend because I, I want to really, I want to, I want to geek out on somebody and tell me about what that feeling's like. And then Sandy goes, well, you've been in front of 65,000 fans. And I go, yeah, but it's, all, you know, I'm, I'm covered up in a bubble. It's not like I'm really, you know, there. So <laughs> I, I just love it. I I'm, I'm excited for us to collaborate together. Uh, can't wait to go see you play. Um, and I appreciate you including me. Oh man, the pleasure is mine. I love the book. Here's the book, folks, The Power of Fun. It's available at Dave Raymond, R-A-Y-M-O-N-D speaks.com. And I learned a lot here today. I got a new friend. We really appreciate it, man. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you guys. Oh, and to all the listeners out there, hey, send us an email, the Rich Redmond Show at gmail.com. And if we have any makeup artists out there in podcasting land, let me know how to get the shine off my forehead. And thank you to our sponsor, Big Dot Lighting. We're also looking for additional sponsors to our show. And uh, what else? Oh, subscribe, share, rate, and review. We always appreciate it. It helps people find the podcast a lot easier. Keep coming back for the good stuff. We appreciate it. Dave, thanks for being here, man. Jim, Rich, thank you. I really appreciate it, too. We'll see you next time, guys. This has been The Rich Redman Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredman.com.